Oh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Brahima Pulibali. I'm the Senior Fellow and Vice President of the Global Economy and Development Program here at Brookings. Thank you for joining us for this uh, virtual event on the state of the global economy. The global economy has been hit uh, by a series of destabilizing shocks over the past two years. As economies were reeling from the unprecedented and devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemics on lives and livelihoods, geopolitical tensions escalated early this year following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The spillover effects of the invasion on global commodity markets, supply chains, financial conditions have significantly deteriorated the economic growth outlook, and inflation rates have reached levels not seen in decades in many countries. In response, central banks are raising interest rates, even as the global economic recovery remains incomplete in several countries. Uh, this response is contributing to a higher cost of capital and could precipitate sovereign debt crisis and further undermine the recovery of many countries. The June edition of the World Bank's uh, Global Economic Prospects, which motivates today's conversation, envisions a sizable one and a quarter percentage point reduction in global growth to just under 3% this year, with heightened risk of recession in several countries. It is a timely and rigorous report that is informed by useful special issues focused on the impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine on energy markets and activity and on the prospects for global stagflation. I encourage you uh, to, to read it if you haven't already. And there's a link to the report on uh, today's event uh, page. But beyond the headline growth numbers, these shocks to the global economy are undermining progress toward the dual objective of eradicating poverty and generating shared prosperity. The report documents a net increase of 75 million in extreme poverty by the end of this year relative to the pre-pandemic projections. And this number could rise further if the global economy enters a recession or stagflation. We have a great panel of experts uh, who will share their views on the state of the global economy and address among others, whether the global economy is entering a recession or stagflation. And importantly, what policymakers can do to navigate the complex set of challenges that the global economy faces and lay the foundation for a more resilient, inclusive and sustainable recovery. So these are among the issues on the minds of uh, our scholars uh, here in the Global Economy and Development Program at Brookings. And we are very pleased to partner for this event with the World Bank, uh, the premier global institution at the forefront of policy solutions to these challenges and their impacts on lives and livelihoods. We are particularly honored and grateful for the participation of the World Bank's president, David Malpass, whose leadership has been instrumental in the global response to the pandemic and to the shock of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, President Malpass will uh, provide some introductory remarks to get us started. And following his remarks, Ayan Koz, who is a non-resident senior fellow in our Global Economy and Development Program and Chief Economist and Director of the Prospects Group at the World Bank, will present highlights of the Global Economic Prospects Report. We will then be joined by three other experts for a panel discussion. So thank you to all of you uh, who have submitted questions already. Uh, you can continue to do so at the email events at brookings.edu or through Twitter using the hashtag global economy in one word. We will get uh, to these questions and comments uh, when we get to the question and answer portion of the event. So without further ado, let me turn the floor over to President Malpass for his remarks. President Malpass, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cool, And thank you to the Brookings Institution. Um, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today uh, to discuss the state of the global economy. I wish I had had a, uh, a brighter uh, image of where the world is going. It, the world is facing multiple crises, including the sharpest slowdown to, in GDP growth in 80 years, uh, 
the risk of a frozen crisis uh, in Ukraine due to the uh, to Russia's invasion uh, and a massive worsening in global inequality as advanced economies absorb the limited supplies of global capital and energy. Global growth is not expected to rebound in 2023, given energy supply constraints, the long overdue normalization of interest rates and bond yields in the advanced economies, and the misallocation of investment that has pushed much of the world's savings into bonds, mostly bonds issued by governments and overcapitalized borrowers. Uh, the global growth, uh, the global economy has also uh, facing uh, uh, significant downside risks. These include intensifying geopolitical tensions, the fragility in many countries, the potential for an extended period of stagflation, uh, the, the, and, and the widespread financial stress uh, that's caused by the higher borrowing costs uh, and the food insecurity. In a recent uh, Churchill Symposium speech I gave at the University of Zurich, I described two major factors in the crisis and some of the World Bank Group's response. So I'd like to summarize those briefly. And then I know there's going to be a great discussion uh, with Ion and the panel uh, about, the, uh, about the global economy. So one of the things I, is very important in the, in the current crisis is the over-reliance on Russian energy and then the, 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 uh, the uh, reallocation uh, of, uh, of redirection of global energy. Um, and I, I described in that uh, speech uh, the trade-off that Europe is making as it and the advanced economies in general as they store fuel and food for next winter. China is the world's uh, biggest storage of grain uh, and is uh, and has continued to increase those uh, stockpiles. Uh, that Europe is uh, storing huge amounts of uh, energy now for the winter and the the. Uh, trade-off that that creates is global fertilizer markets uh, don't have the energy, the natural gas needed to make the fertilizer, to make the crops, and to build the, the, uh, uh, the, the storage for their own use into next uh, year. And so global food insecurity is worsening. Uh, also, as we've seen, the electricity uh, supplies are diminishing because of the, again, the shortage of natural gas, which is the swing provider of electricity around the world in country after country. Uh, those shortages then leave the grids in brownout and in blackout conditions, which undermines the, uh, undercuts the, uh, the production efforts of those countries. So we're looking at a crisis uh, that on the production side that uh, will extend into 2023 uh, as, as, as the world searches for ways to bring enough capital to bear to increase uh, the production of energy and fertilizer and that enabling the agricultural system. All of this can be done in ways that are cleaner, that are greener, that reduce carbon uh, intensity in the, in the global supply chains. But at our, at our present uh, uh, conditions, that's not being done. So we see, we have to look at the prospect into 2023 of, the, of this trade-off continuing where uh, where Europe and advanced economies in general use up much of the cleaner fuel, and that leaves uh, many parts of the world reopening their coal-fired plants or extending the life of some of the most carbon-intensive coal-fired uh, coal-fired coal power plants. This comes at a time when the investments in the in the electricity grids in many of the world's uh, countries haven't been strengthened to absorb the uh, uh, the renewables that are needed in their grids. So you end up uh, with uh, with uh, a global electricity crisis on top of the food, fuel, and uh, uh, fertilizer crisis that I've been describing. The, the second area that I wanted to raise and that I discussed in some detail uh, is on the monetary policy side. Uh, the major central banks moved further away from monetarism in, in, uh, in many recent years. Some of them entirely removed the reserve requirement on banks uh, and adopted a post-monetarist framework in which central banks 
both regulate and allocate capital rather than controlling the money supply through bank reserves. That's been a major shift in the global economy over the last decade. Um, the regulatory framework has the explicit bias that debt of advanced country governments is considered zero risk, while other debt, especially of small businesses, of developing countries, and of new entrants to the market, is treated as risky and requires uh, costly bank equity capitalization. Um, separately, so th that, that process has caused a huge misallocation of capital in the world to the safest uh, issuers of bonds and away from the, the places in the world that need new capital. Separately, uh, the purchase and ownership of bonds by central banks, the purchase and ownership of bonds, which continues to, to this day in giant size, allocates capital from small bank accounts, that's the, the providers of the bank reserves that uh, the central banks are drawing on, the liability of the central banks is bank reserves which come from banks. And so they draw on that uh, and uh, shift it to bond issuers. The result of that is to increase asset prices in overcapitalized sectors of the, of the advanced economies. So from an inequality standpoint, this framework misallocates capital. It favors those with higher net worth at the expense of broad-based growth. That was already evident before the COVID crisis, and it was evident before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And so these are, these are uh, challenges in the global system that, that have needed to be addressed. If the anti-inflationary policies that are now getting underway are primarily achieved through interest rate increases, it risks deepening the inequality uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that is so problematic in the world. Stagflation could worsen. Uh, it's exacerbated by shortages of the working capital needed for small businesses and supply chains. So we have a system patently set up uh, that diverts capital to the big players and not to the small players that provide the solution to the current inflation problem. There are uh, important additional tools that policymakers could be doing on the monetary front. They, 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 they could and should encourage a very strong supply response to counteract the price increases uh, that are underway. And the most the most available increases in supply are in the largest economies. That's a fact of the mathematics and also the availability of capital. So the United States has the biggest ability in the world to expand production in order to counteract the uh, global inflation underway, but there's not steps uh, being taken to, uh, to dramatically increase uh, US production of the, of the uh, supplies that are in shortage. Uh, but that's also true of China, the second largest economy, and of Europe, the, 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 uh, also in combination, a very large portion of the world's economy. Uh, so I wanted to go through those uh, challenges in detail. And then I wanted to give you a little sense of what the World Bank has been doing in order to uh, uh, respond to these clear crises going on around the world. We've, we've tried to be in, in the forefront of efforts. I speak with the world leaders about these problems, about the need for massive new production in the advanced economies in order to counteract, uh, also uh, by the uh, misallocation of capital coming from the macro frameworks in the world. What the World Bank has, is able to do and has done is very large early support for the people of Ukraine. Uh, we continued that even yesterday with a $1.7 billion disbursement uh, that came from money supplied by the U.S. That's on top of the $1.3 billion disbursement late in June, also provided by the U.S. We were supplying our own funding early in the, in the, uh, uh, in the war in the war effort, and that's helped sustain people in Ukraine, the pensioners, the hospital workers, and government workers in Ukraine. Um, we've we've also uh, in we're in the process of mobilizing uh, more for Ukraine as the war as the war persists. On the food front, <clears throat> we we entered an alliance with the G7 presidency, Germ which is Germany this year. <clears throat> 
and are providing uh, $30 billion of, re of uh, uh, resources available over the next 15 months to support interventions in agriculture, to make it more climate smart, stronger systems, more resilient systems, uh, also to provide funding for social protection. It's very important that as the world faces uh, this giant crisis, that subsidies be targeted and that import and export restrictions be, be removed, uh, be reduced, by the advanced economies, which many of them have strong import restrictions that uh, impede global agricultural markets, and also by exporting countries so that they don't limit it. Uh, we're, we're putting in uh, emergency assistance. We've recently approved more than a dozen programs, including in Lebanon, Egypt, and 11 countries across Eastern and Southern Africa to help uh, increase the resilience of food systems and tackle food insecurity. And we're a strong advocate for good global uh, uh, policies in terms of subsidies, export and import restrictions, and reduction of excess uh, supply uh, storage. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, China is the or it, China is the world's second biggest economy. It's the world's biggest producer of wheat, and but it's also the world's biggest storer of uh, of of wheat uh, and other other agricultural products. And so this provides one possible source as the world faces this impending and deepening crisis. I want to, uh, to have a say a final word on the global debt situation and then turn back to cool. Um, the global debt is connected, tightly connected to this food crisis uh, because of the shortage of fiscal space in the poorest countries. As you know, the the uh, uh, the DSSI that was done by the G20, by the way, the G20 is meeting even today and trying to work on a communique, but it's been uh, very difficult for the G20 members to find consensus on any of these major topics. Um, so as we look back, the G20 did the debt suspension initiative. All it did was defer the payments, but then the interest kept compounding on those payments. And so the countries are left with an even larger uh, set of debt burdens. The G20 initiated the, the common framework, but it, it, for debt, uh, for debt reduction for debt relief, but it has been stalled. Uh, even this morning, Chad uh, Chad's creditor committee met but was unable to make progress. Uh, there's We are hopeful of progress in Zambia, but that, that's been one and it's been ongoing for uh, for over a year and a half, I, I suppose. Uh, and so we, we are left with giant amounts of uh, unsustainable debt in developing countries without a methodology to reduce that uh, debt. And so this means that the countries are still paying to rich creditors, uh, and uh, there's not a process that's going to uh, allow them or help them uh, to move into more sustainable debt territory. So that problem is one of the many overlapping crises facing the world. So I wanted to end on that uh, point, Cool, that uh, one thing that would be good for uh, for Brookings or the U.S. or for the think tank community uh, to be engaged in is how do we have a uh, major change? Uh, you know, I and the World Bank have proposed many very specific changes that would make this situation work better. Uh, but it would be good to have a consensus uh, on uh, on the steps that are needed in order to reduce the uh, unsustainable debt situations and to increase the transparency of debt, new debt as it's taken on. Uh, uh, by by countries, and that I think needs to be kept in this list of uh, major policy uh, initiatives and endeavors that are needed as we go through these overlapping crises. Thank you very much, and I'll look forward to hearing the uh, panel and the results. Over to you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, President Malpas, uh, for this very insightful remark that frames perfectly the issues that we face in the global economy and kind of sets up well, I think, the panel discussion uh, that uh, will follow. And uh, we hear your call and here at Brookings as well, we've been very much uh, working with the uh, G7, G20 through the T7, T20 processes, as well as with the UN leadership on uh, some of the solutions to these uh, challenges. Uh, and thank you again for your leadership, really, and that of the World Bank 
and these very challenging times. So we hope to be able to welcome you back again in the near future. Thank you. We will now turn uh, to the uh, presentation segment of the event. Uh, so Ayan Goes, that I introduced earlier, uh, will, uh, will present uh, the highlights. Ayan, over to you. Thank you, Cool. Uh, and let me express my appreciation as well uh, for inviting us. Uh, great to be here following uh, David's opening remarks and joining uh, this distinguished panel. Uh, let me share uh, some slides uh, quickly and um, provide a, a, a summary of the latest report, uh, Global Economic Prospects. Uh, to structure the discussion, I am going to focus on three uh, specific questions. Uh, what are near-term prospects for the global economy? What is a stagflation threat to emerging developing economies? And what are the policy priorities for uh, these economies? Uh, throughout the presentation, I'm going to use this acronym EMBs, Emerging Market and Developing Economies. So uh, you provide a very nice summary. Uh, David already mentioned the challenges uh, confronting the global economy. Obviously, the war in Ukraine casting a long shadow over growth prospects with it is significant spillovers, higher commodity prices, elevated uncertainty. Uh, global trade was already weakening. Uh, that uh, weakness is going to be deeper. And of course, we have uh, persistent supply chain uh, disruptions. All of these challenges are taking place alongside a synchronized monetary and fiscal policy withdrawal. Against this background, uh, our forecast suggests that the world economy will experience its sharpest deceleration following an initial recovery from a global recession in more than 80 years. So we are uh, experiencing a, a historical uh, slowdown in economic growth. This is important because you ask about, uh, you know, are we uh, getting into territory of a global recession and stagflation? I'm going to uh, touch on those issues. Global growth is projected to slow from the record high pace 5.7% last year to 2.9% this year. Um, and it is important here to observe that from this year to the next, we do not expect growth actually picking up much. The disruptions uh, you mentioned and uh, David mentioned will be there for the foreseeable future and policy tightening uh, will continue uh, keeping the growth uh, pretty much range bound. When you look at advanced economies, uh, there as well, there is of course a sharp slowdown and that slowdown will continue next year along with uh, tightening of policies and disruptions on the supply side, especially in the context of energy. In the case of emerging market developing economies, we are expecting growth to have half of the growth rate what we saw last year, uh, settling around 3.2%. And what else you see in this figure, we pretty much downgraded forecast across all country groups. Now, um, as we are discussing the possibility of a global recession, we need to think about how synchronized this slowdown is. And when you look at this figure, it shows you a fraction of countries, we, forecast, the, we downgraded forecast, uh, upgraded or unchanged, uh, kept unchanged, you see that the figure is pretty much red. There is bleeding uh, around the world when you think about the downgrades. Um, in the case of advanced economies, we downgrade the growth forecast for this year, more than 80% of them. If you look at emerging developing economies, uh, around 70% of them. If you look at commodity importing emerging developing economies, Again, uh, more than 80% of them were subject to growth downgrades. Energy exporters, for obvious reasons, did much better. So uh, most of them were upgraded. But when you look at other commodity exporters, those economies as well experiencing significant downgrades. 
Let me briefly talk about low-income countries. They were not doing well prior to the uh, pandemic. And of course, the prior to the war, their growth rates were uh, the stuttering and that will continue for the foreseeable future. And of course, we are very worried about the food shortages in the context of these low-income countries. Uh, there are significant risks uh, confronting this, uh, this outlook. Uh, and these risks are uh, interlinked and they're uh, amplifying each other. Uh, David already mentioned some of these risks. Geopolitical tensions are there. We know the possible consequences of that. The high inflation, weak growth, uh, increases the likelihood of period of stagflation. And those uh, stagflationary pressures could intensify that could translate into even a, a more aggressive uh, monetary policy tightening stance. And that can easily translate into, of course, uh, financial stress uh, given uh, elevated debt levels. Um, and, and those debt levels, of course, increased significantly during the past decade and the pandemic added fuel to the, the, the increase. We are also worried about, of course, the energy and food insecurity in many countries. The energy issue, uh, David discussed extensively, but food uh, insecurity has is a, is a been a significant problem uh, in a number of regions and in all likelihood will be with us for the foreseeable future. And whenever when you think about weak growth, uh, food insecurity, uh, high inflation, uh, we need to worry about social tensions flaring up. And that risk uh, can manifest itself in unpredictable ways uh, in multiple countries, given the, the, the prospects we are discussing here. Um, supply disruptions can be persistent. And of course, the climate-related risks are still with us. With the war, uh, global economy is facing another major risk that is associated with the fragmentation of trade, investment, and financial networks. And that risk has huge consequences for uh, the medium-term growth prospects, and uh, we can discuss that uh, during the panel. Now, how should we think about these risks and how these risks basically affect our baseline growth outcomes? Uh, we focused on three uh, key risks. One, a more aggressive tightening of monetary policy by the Fed that could uh, trigger financial stress. Another one, a sharper increase in commodity prices driven by energy supply disruptions. And the third one, uh, COVID-19 outbreaks, uh, especially in China, that could uh, lead to lockdowns and further uh, supply disruptions and slowdown in China. Uh, when you put together all these three uh, happening at the same time, and that's not an unlikely scenario, given how these risks interact together, uh, that could bring the global economy uh, to the brink of a very sharp downturn, uh, but not necessarily a global recession. Uh, at the end, especially in 2023, you might end up growth uh, going down around one and a half percent. Uh, but for a global recession, you really need to go below 1% that will push the basically per capita global growth rate into negative territory. And that is the, you know, the definition of global recession. Is that possible? Under certain scenarios, uh, that, that is po the possibility. And we can discuss that uh, when we move to the panel. So why is stagflation a threat to the emerging market economies? We already talked about the uh, uh, elevated inflation numbers. Um, the, the today's uh, U.S. inflation uh, uh, release, uh, I think, is another reminder how uh, persistent inflation is. The, the the another record number, the highest since uh, 1981 for the U.S. The CPI and core also uh, uh, picked up a little bit. Now. <clears throat> What you see in these two figures, it's quite important how growth and inflation uh, forecasts have evolved in the recent past at the global level. And uh, of course, uh, these two variables are moving in opposite directions, growth forecast being downgraded and inflation forecast being upgraded. So the, thinking about the growth and inflation outlook, uh, uh, global economy uh, looks eerily similar to the uh, the stagflation uh, period of the 1970s. And that uh, similarity has higher, of course, today than what we had 
uh, six months ago. Here, it's important to uh, talk about uh, stagflation. It's not a very well-defined concept. Uh, the general consensus is that it's a state of high inflation and weak growth. If you define inflation, high inflation as inflation above targets or multi-year highs, uh, you basically have uh, uh, that type of inflation. If you define weak growth as steeply slowing growth, and this year qualifies that, next year qualifies that, and I think 2020s will uh, bring weaker growth than 2010s. So um, the experience of 1970s is important uh, because it basically caused significant damage to the global economy. We ended up with a global recession in the, uh, in the early 1980s because of the aggressive tightening of monetary policy. And for emerging market developing economies, that tightening cycle in the 19, early 1980s translated into the largest number of debt crises uh, over a decade. So there has been an intense debate on this issue with respect to similarities and differences. I'm going to briefly summarize our findings. With respect to uh, similarities, uh, there are three important uh, observations. One, uh, global inflation is high now. It was high over the period uh, of you know, the 1970, 80, and you see that on the, on the left. So still what we have in 2022 is lower than the average. But uh, when you look at the growth slowdown we had in the 1970s and the growth slowdown we are forecasting now, we are going to see a much uh, sharper uh, slowdown uh, in economic growth. 1970s was a period of uh, monetary policy accommodation and uh, 2010s, of course, uh, was a period of monetary policy accommodation. One uh, way of thinking about that accommodation is the, you know, the uh, real interest rates at the global level, real interest rates average minus 0.5 in the 1970s. And since 2010, uh, it averaged minus 0.5. One important issue in the context of emerging developing economies, they accumulated significant amount of debt in the 1970s uh, for a variety of reasons. And in 2010s, actually they accumulated uh, the largest amount of debt over a decade uh, since uh, 1970. And now they have a much larger um, debt stock than what uh, they had in 1980. So there are significant similarities, and these similarities uh, worry us. But there are some important differences as well. And the first important difference is uh, in the 1970s, monetary policy frameworks were not well defined. There were competing objectives. Uh, and almost uh, all uh, developing economies had managed exchange rate regimes that limited their ability to effectively uh, employ monetary policy. This is a different era. Uh, there's a paradigm shift. Uh, a number of uh, countries uh, employing inflation targeting regimes, a number of countries have credible uh, monetary policy frameworks, and because of that, long-term inflation expectations remain uh, stable. And that's the single most important difference. Uh, our thinking about inflation, the importance of uh, uh, price stability has changed dramatically, and uh, we think that central banks have better frameworks to cope with inflation, and those better frameworks and the credibility of keeping inflation under target for an extended period over the past uh, two decades, give them the room to basically have ammunition to cope with the inflation problem. You look at wage pressures in the United States uh, and the labor market rigidities around the world, uh, those are not you know, the types of uh, pressures we saw in the, in the 70s or the types of rigidities we saw uh, in the uh, 70s. So the, the, this wage price uh, spiral type of uh, inflationary push uh, hopefully will not be there. And of course, uh, economies are more energy efficient. Uh, the reliance on energy is lower today than uh, what we had in the 70s. So there are good reasons to, uh, to worry and good reasons to be optimistic. Now, one important issue is that uh, apart from these similarities and differences, monetary policies are responding. And uh, in the case of euro area, as well as in the United States, uh, policymakers uh, responded. Uh, there are questions whether this response was delayed. Uh, but irrespective of that, uh, there is clear 
uh, acceptance that this issue, uh, the elevated inflation, should be reined in. And in the case of emerging market economies, uh, they have actually started the tightening cycle earlier than advanced economies, and we are expecting that tightening cycle also to continue in emerging developing economies. So what's the big problem? When you have elevated debt levels, significant vulnerabilities, of course, you see uh, massive capital outflows from emerging developing economies. And we have already been seeing that, as you see on this uh, right panel. With uh, record high debt levels, significant uh, fiscal deficit, still the legacies, of course, the pandemic and the 2010s, there uh, we are worried about this tightening cycle could translate into financial stress in uh, many emerging market developing economies, given the uh, vulnerabilities. Finally, what are the policy priorities? Let me be very quick on these. Uh, there are some global uh, issues. David alluded to these. Uh, policymakers need to mitigate the effects of the war. And uh, in that context, uh, uh, coping with the food insecurity in vulnerable countries is a critical priority for the global community. And then um, among all these uh, competing objectives, still supporting the green, uh, resilient, and inclusive recovery gonna be important. There are significant policy trade-offs. Uh, those trade-offs need to be taken into account when policies are formulated. Uh, debt relief is going to be important. We need to have a robust structure to deal with debt problems. And of course, we need to be very aggressive in terms of facilitating energy transition and do that in an intelligent way. I mentioned this fragmentation challenge that requires a global community coming together and sticking the rules-based international economic order uh, that has served the global economy very well over the past three decades. Uh, at the national level, I think that credibility, uh, calibration, and communication of policies are going to be all critical in the context of monetary policy, in the context of fiscal policy, and in the context of uh, financial policy. Managing short-term policy trade-offs in an environment growth is slowing, uh, inflationary pressures are still present, and supply constraints are pressuring the economies going to be uh, critical. In the case of emerging market developing economies, they have no choice but to stick to structural policies, thinking about you know, how they can improve growth prospects. Let me uh, conclude. What are near-term prospects for the global economy? We are uh, expecting a much sharper global slowdown than what we had in uh, January 2022. We are not... Uh, seeing a global recession in the baseline, but that can easily change and because of these multiple downside risks. Why we are worried about stagflation? We see the signs of that uh, with uh, inflationary pressures and weakening growth prospects. The important message here, the 1970s stagflation episode ended with a series of financial crises in emerging developing economies. These economies are now facing rising risk of a similar outcome, given the vulnerabilities that they have. And what are the policy priorities? Uh, I think I summarized those. Uh, let me uh, uh, turn to you, Kul. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity. I look forward to the discussion uh, with the panelists. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, great. Uh, uh, thank you, Ayan, and I commend you for uh, succinctly summarizing a 176 page uh, uh, report in about uh, in a few slides and in 15 minutes uh, uh, to 20 minutes or so. Uh, thanks for the great work uh, from you and your colleagues uh, who have produced this report. So we'll now turn it to the uh, panel discussion of the event. Uh, so we're really fortunate to have uh, uh, three experts to join us to help make sense of this all. Uh, earlier, I had introduced uh, Ayan, uh, so he would uh, stay on as a panelist and will be joined by uh, uh, the first, the second panelist will be Julia uh, Coronado. Uh, Julia is a president and founder of Macro uh, Policy Perspective, and she's also clinical associate professor of finance at the McCombs uh, School of Business at the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, 
Julia has more than a decade of experience as a financial market economist, including serving as chief economist for Graham Capital Management and uh, BNP Paribas. The third panelist uh, is Steve Kamen. He is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Previously, he served as director of international finance program at the Federal Reserve, where he led the institution's work on the impact of foreign economies on the US and vice versa. And the fourth panelist is Abebe Selassie, who is a director of the Africa Department at the International Monetary Fund, an institution that is also playing a leadership role in the response to the series of shocks to the global economy that we've, uh, we've mentioned and that we'll be discussing uh, today. Um, so before I turn to other panelists, Ayan, just to get a clarification from you, I think we, I get that you're not calling yet for a global recession, although there are downsides risks that should make us a bit concerned about it. Well, what about stagflation? Uh, are you calling for stagflation in your baseline, or that is also subject to some downside risk, which may or may not materialize? Uh, thank you, Kul. Uh, global recession actually is a, is a difficult uh, concept to define, and uh, at least uh, we have this definition. You need to have uh, contraction in uh, per capita global GDP, uh, along with uh, broad-based uh, slowdown in uh, other global variables. Uh, that's what we use uh, in, in the World Bank and what we use in the IMF as well. Uh, now, in the context of stagflation, uh, there is this you know, uh, plain vanilla definition, uh, high inflation, weak growth, uh, but there is no threshold for high inflation. There's no threshold for weak growth. Now, what we see uh, with these figures I showed you, really, um, the the we are not still in the 1970s, but we are getting there, and probably we are closer today than uh, you know a year ago or six months ago. So mm -hmm. uh, I think to have stagflation, you need to see a uh, significant uh, weaker growth and a higher inflation for an extended period of time. One uh, uh, caveat here: when we think about stagflation, uh, we should also think about what's going on in labor markets. Uh, in a paradoxical fashion, uh, labor markets, for example, in the U.S., remain uh, rather, you know, strong. So uh, in the case of uh, global recession, that risk is there. In the case of global stagflation, uh, yes, there are huge similarities. But uh, whether we are in the midst of a stagflation, uh, I think that that's open to the question, just because of the uh, difficulty of pinning down uh, the definition of stagflation. But let me stop there. Okay, great, and uh, thank you. I was uh, now, if I can turn to you, uh, uh, Julia, if you can, uh, how you see all of this, and if as part of your opening remarks, you can uh, uh, you can comment a bit on the uh, the state of play in the U.S. We've just gotten, as was mentioned earlier, inflation today, uh, nine percent uh, for the month of June. That's quite uh, high, and. For June 2, we got uh, the labor market report that was showing uh, a really strong labor market. I think 370 or so uh, thousand uh, new jobs added. So this all seems to fly in the face of those, all this discussion and concerns about uh, inflation. How do you see it? Thank you, Cool, and thank you uh, for inviting me to join this uh, this panel. I've really enjoyed the presentation so far. Um, so as already outlined, we've had a sequence of incredibly disruptive shocks. Uh, the pandemic itself disrupted not only the production and transportation of goods, which was the original front of inflation, um, but also how and where we work, how and where we educate our children, uh, the my, global migration patterns, just pretty much everything uh, in our economic lives has been disrupted by the pandemic. And then we layer on to that, uh, you know, a, a war in Ukraine that reveals, I think, some structural realities of a more polarized world that poses risks to uh, the availability of, of a range of commodities and poses extreme risks to um, the more vulnerable emerging market economies. In the US, you know, I think the US and other advanced economies had the fiscal space met this challenge uh, 
uh, with unprecedented support for, for two main reasons. One, because of the failures of the past. Um, we were too tepid in our support of the economy after the Great Recession. Uh, and we decided not to do that. And it was easy both politically and policy wise to do that because the pandemic was nobody's fault. It was a true exogenous shock. And I do want to highlight that we've had some very significant successes from that approach. We have had, as you noted, this the fastest labor market recovery on record. We know from economic research that that will reduce the, the scarring to earnings, lifetime earnings of, uh, of people in the economy. We've had re reduced delinquencies across loan categories. So the strongest sort of credit quality of the economy that we've ever had. Uh, so, but we've also gotten this inflation shock because partly of the demand support and now the, the uh, layering on of the war shock. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that I, uh, you know, we, we focus on the Fed, we focus on monetary policy and central bankers have pivoted. They're, they're aggressively tightening policy, addressing the demand side. And I think that that's a, a productive pivot. Um, but I think we really need to, and I think the, the Ihan's presentation and, and David's comments really highlighted, we need to focus as much with as much intensity on the supply side of the economy. And in particular, in a polarized world, in a world where we're trying to make an energy transition, we need extreme focus on the stability of the food and energy and broad commodity supplies, the inputs we need for the technology sector, for the green transition. Um, we need to get comfortable with, these are not things that the private sector will naturally solve on its own. We need industrial policies to be much more front and center, stabilizing forces, which is nothing new. We've always had stabilizing policies with regard to agriculture. We need to expand that into the energy and commodity sphere, the inputs into the green economy. So I think, you know, certainly this series of shocks makes a recession more likely. That recession will do something, uh, you know, it's not like our base case. I still think it's like a 50-50 shot that we enter. The U.S. enters a recession. Certainly other economies will. Um, but and, and that is already cooling off some of the intensity in commodity prices but that won't be enough on an ongoing basis. I think we really need to see this as a structural challenge mm -hmm. uh, and meet it with more medium term solutions. And I'll just stop there. Mm -hmm. uh, no, thank you. Thank you, Julia. But then in terms of then Fed policy, uh, I get that there's supply side to this. So clearly the, uh, concurring this inflation will require not just the Fed action, but also um, some action on the supply side. Mm -hmm. But in light of the strong data and the meeting coming up later this month, uh, what do you expect? I mean, I think we're at least going to see a 75 basis point rate hike. That's already been reasonably well telegraphed. And there's some chance that either they will raise rates 100 basis points in July or signal that another 75 basis point hike is likely in September. So those seem like, you know, we and they have time to sort of lay the table for that uh, outcome before uh, the meeting in July. So I think those are two reasonable options. The, the, the strategy has been to get to a neutral stance and a somewhat restrictive stance as expeditiously as possible that the, the day, this round of data only deepens that uh, the conviction and the dedication to that strategy. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, thank you. And obviously, as they ramp up the increases in interest rates, clearly there would be uh, spillovers uh, to uh, other countries. So if I can now turn to you, Steve, uh, to bring you into uh, this conversation and uh, invite you, if possible, to comment on uh, the potential spillovers effects of uh, Fed policy on other EM, emerging market and developing economies. Over to you, Steve. Thanks, Cole. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, have the opportunity to learn from my very knowledgeable uh, co-panelists. Um, let me start off by saying I'm completely on board uh, with IHAN's presentation and review of the global outlook. Clearly, there are huge numbers of risks. And uh, while if I were writing a baseline forecast for the world economy, 
I too would not predict the recession because you never predict recessions. Uh, if a world recession were to materialize, I would not be hugely surprised. Um, now, focusing you know, on you know, critical aspects of the outlook, uh, I, I, I just want to point out that from a humanitarian perspective, the most worrisome aspect of the outlook at present are probably the food and energy shortages that resulted from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, which President Malfass uh, underscored. Uh, but from a macro and financial uh, standpoint, the key issue is probably the future trajectory of inflation. And so IHAN's review of the stagflation of the 70s is especially germane. Now I would underscore Ihan's view that a key feature of the 1970s stagnation was the failure of central banks and governments to really clamp down on inflation before it got under control. And in that sense, our pandemic replay of the 1970s experience has actually been very short lived, okay? Maybe the last year or so. As, as Ihan pointed out, emerging market central banks have already uh, been tightening policy for some time now. And now all the advanced economy central banks are following suit. And certainly for the Fed, obviously predictions of future tightening you know, have mounted greatly. So what this means is that going forward, uh, my main worry is that if inflationary pressures remain pretty strong, I'm not so much worried about say, seeing a bout of 1970s stagnation, stagflation where central banks allow inflation expectations to rise, but rather I'm more worried about basically leapfrogging to the early 80s, uh, you know, bout of global recessions and financial crises. So, so that, and so, you know, which I did underscore as a risk. Now, I want to note that contrary to conventional wisdom, a rise in global interest rates is not always bad for emerging markets and developing countries. Uh, when Fed tightening is being driven by strong prospects for U.S. economic growth, uh, like took place in the mid-2000s, uh, that can often be quite benign uh, for emerging markets. Uh, the problem is when those rates are rising in response to higher inflation or in response to a hawkish shift uh, in Fed strategy. And in those circumstances, the research I've done with colleagues, uh, including at the World Bank, has indicated that that can be a lot more disruptive for global capital flows uh, and emerging markets. And clearly as evidenced by the recent inflation print for June, uh, that latter scenario with high inflation, Fed getting hawkish is what we're seeing these days. Now what's interesting is that despite the, the soaring inflation and the Fed's hawkish turn, and despite the basically the resultant freakout in global stock markets, we're not seeing a huge amount of pressure on emerging financial markets, or at least not so far. Now, it's true that as I had showed, there's been some diminishing of portfolio capital flows. But if you look at kind of like indicators of emerging market financial markets, like uh, credit spreads, they've gone up, but really not that much compared to their prior history. And it's also interesting that the dollar has been rising more quickly against the currencies of other advanced economies uh, than it has against the currencies of emerging markets. Now, I think that's partly because the higher commodity prices, you know, have buoyed the prospects of a lot of commodity exporters like Brazil and Mexico. Uh, it's also partly because U.S. credit markets have held up pretty well. Uh, maybe Julia can speak to that more. U.S. corporate high yield spreads, again, they've gone up, but they're nowhere close to their earlier peaks. And then finally, it's worth noting that emerging market central banks, as I mentioned before, have really been extraordinary, extraordinarily proactive about raising interest rates. And that too may have helped to counter uh, some tendency toward capital flight. So, so right now we're kind of in a wait and see situation. We really, you know, we, nobody predicted the huge surge uh, in inflation that we've seen with possible exception of Larry Summers. Uh, and so nobody really knows when it's gonna recede and nobody knows how much central bank tightening is going to be needed to make it recede. Uh, so, you know, to repeat Ihan's point, uh, the risks are certainly out there. And I'll stop here. Yeah. So, let's see if, if I can follow up. Uh, so, um, you've outlined the conditions under which, uh, you know, tightening of Fed policy uh, might not may lead to you know, different outcomes. But in this particular context, you had 
you know, several countries that were still reeling from the effect of the pandemic shock. And I think before this Russian invasion, we were talking more of a, a, um, a divergence recovery. Uh, and then it's in the context, then we're now getting uh, Fed policy tightening, uh, which clearly is going to raise the cost of capital for some of the emerging markets and developing countries. So what in your view, and based on both the 80s experience, uh, the taper tantrum, and what can those emerging market and developing countries do to minimize or mitigate the spillovers? And what can the Fed do on its side, if anything, to also minimize or mitigate those spillovers, assuming the Fed is going to raise because US conditions are indicate that they should, but is there anything they can do that would minimize the spillovers? Um, well, those are excellent questions. And I can tell you that I do not, and I don't believe anybody has any great answers besides, quote, do the right thing, unquote. Mm -hmm. In other words, the key, one of the key factors that influences how disruptive US monetary policy tightening spillovers are to emerging markets is their degree of financial and macroeconomic vulnerability. And so it's clear during the taper tantrum and almost every uh, uh, global risk aversion episode that the more financially vulnerable economies, the ones with the lower credit ratings, are the ones that get hit hardest. So what do emerging market and developing countries have to do? They have to follow prudent monetary policy, which in an era of, of increasing risk aversion probably means tightening interest rates. They need to use those to tamp down inflation. They need to take extra measures to make sure their fiscal balances stay under control. They need to, you know, they need, and they need to uh, implement the wide range of pro-growth policies uh, that Ihan uh, described. Uh, what does the Fed need to do? This gets back to this long-standing debate over whether the Fed takes other countries' economic fortunes into account and should it take other countries' economic fortunes into account? Uh, I think the, the, the broad answer that I've come up with, which not everybody loves, is that if the Fed does the right thing for the US economy and for US financial markets, that will generally be good for global financial markets and uh, global economies as well. Um, but what does that mean in this context? What it means is, is that if the Fed faces an inflation surge and it needs to tighten policy in order to get inflation under control, uh, other, the spillovers to other countries are less if it actually does those uh, policies than if it waits till inflation gets even more out of control. So in the speeches that I used to write for my bosses at the Fed, I would always end their speeches with, so what does the Fed have to do? It has to be clear and transparent with its communications to not surprise markets and mm -hmm. to let markets understand the factors driving Fed policy. Mm -hmm. uh, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Abebe, if I may now uh, turn to you, uh, I mentioned the divergence in the recovery, and I think a lot of uh, the low-income countries, many of them in the Africa region that uh, you, you, you cover, we're still reeling from the effect of the pandemic. And uh, at that time, I thought the best thing that could be done was to uh, ramp up vaccine distribution and having equitable access to vaccine and all things would start getting better. And then this crisis hit, which has come with energy crisis, inflation crisis. Uh, I mean, layer all of that on top of uh, uh, the uh, looming, uh, some, what some have called looming sovereign debt crisis. And, so it looks like uh, really the uh, perfect uh, uh, fiscal storm for uh, the countries in, in, in the region. So how, how, how are you seeing things uh, playing out? Thanks, Cole. Thanks for having me uh, at this very important uh, event and important discussion. Um, you know, I, I think uh, more than just a cyclical uh, business cycle type event, I see this as a very, very pivotal moment for the trajectory of, uh, of uh, development outcomes in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and uh, many low-income countries. So the first point I want to make is um, I'll, I'll you know, try and unpack why I think this is really a very, very worrisome moment and why it's pivotal for both domestic policy makers and the international community to act really very boldly. Second point I will make is like what kind of policies are going to be needed uh, to be taken by uh, policymakers, and then thirdly, what uh, the international community can do. 
So I think, uh, you know, cool, uh, the last 15, 20 years in sub-Saharan Africa in particular, but really many low-income countries, have been a period of fairly strong growth and uh, improvements in development outcomes like we've never seen before. And in my view, I think there are three important factors that uh, contributed to this. Uh, first of these, of course, was this was a period where there was a lot of fiscal policy space in countries and there were a lot of domestic reforms pursued by policymakers, positive ones, strengthening institutions and moving public finance management broadly in the right direction. A second uh, important factor that contributed to this period of high growth and improved development outcomes was a uh, very benign, uh, very supportive global environment, uh, emergence of China on the global scene, high global growth, uh, ample financing, relatively elevated commodity prices uh, for those countries that are commodity exporters. And then the third one, I think, was uh, that there was quite significant official development assistance to countries also over this period. In the 2000s, you know, quite a bit of debt relief. These all, I think, contributed to this uh, important period of um, uh, progress. Unfortunately, now we see all three factors in reverse or having weakened significantly, uh, you know, take uh, domestic policy reforms. The appetite for reforms really has waned with the decline in fiscal policy space, with a lot more political constraints uh, in countries. Uh, the global economic outlook, I think IAN painted uh, the picture. Huh? Uh, we are going into a period of economic difficulty. Uh, all of the issues that we know about financial markets having turned sour uh, in terms of uh, frontier market economies in particular that have been relying quite a bit on external markets. And the third factor, uh, official development assistance, really has also been declining quite, quite acutely um, towards the region. I think, uh, you know, where we had about 4% of recipient G country GDP uh, in ODA uh, to low-income countries, we're now seeing 2.5% uh, or so. So official development assistance has been declining quite a bit. So, um, you know, external communities also not been as supportive. I think it all uh, means cool that, you know, we are looking not just at a difficult uh, macroeconomic uh, moment for the region, uh, but really uh, we're talking about a generation of Africans that are going to be coming of age now that are, not, that are going to be seeing diminished prospects for development progress. Huh? So I really want to stress this point being this is a very, very pivotal moment where both domestic policy uh, makers, but also the international community needs to act boldly. Mm -hmm. You know, just to uh, touch on what, uh, what needs to be done, I mean, domestically, I think countries are going to have to take quite a bit of uh, bold action, make uh, difficult uh, policy trade-offs. Uh, with regard to inflation, for example, quite a lot of, you know, central banks are going to have to be quite nimble in their response. Uh, as you said earlier, countries are still recovering uh, from, uh, from the pandemic. Output gaps have not closed in the vast majority of countries. So, uh, paying heed to that, but also uh, heading off any inflationary acceleration will be important. A lot of other similar reforms that have to be done on the public finance management side. But I want to, you know, end really by saying a little bit uh, cool on what the international community needs to do. And here, I think, you know, uh, President Malpass earlier touched on uh, the very, very problematic debt architecture that we are, countries are facing right now. Uh, you know, uh, in those countries where debt vulnerabilities have accelerated um, and risen quite a bit and are facing, uh, you know, acute debt difficulties, it will be very, very important uh, that creditors uh, provide the required debt relief. As well, though, I think the financing side is also important. Huh? There are quite a lot of countries which are not uh, the other side of uh, debt difficulties, uh, if I may put it that way. And for those countries, uh, increased concessional financing is going to be important. Why? I mean, after all, you know, uh, while there are policy-induced, domestic-induced uh, issues, quite a bit of the strain has come from uh, these, this brutal cocktail of exogenous shocks that have hit countries. Huh? Uh, and, uh, you know, in a context like this, I think availability of ample concessional financing will be important. Yeah, yeah no, thank, thank you. Thank you, Abebe. And I think uh, David also in his remark touched on the DSSI that has, you know, expired uh, late last year, which means now even higher cost of debt servicing. And there's the G20 common framework, but it seemed like, as uh, he mentioned, uh, there's a bit of frustration in the speed with which it's being uh, 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 implemented. Uh, he touched on Chad, but I believe there's also Ethiopia maybe, and 
Zambia as well. So what's the state of play there? Uh, if there were widespread sovereign debt crisis today, are we, uh, are we equipped really to, to deal with this? I mean, really, uh, the frank uh, answer is no. Uh, I think the common framework uh, needs to be a lot more uh, responsive uh, than it has been in the recent past. Mm -hmm. Now, to be fair, uh, you know, we really should recognize that the, the coming together of the G20 countries as a creditor group, mm -hmm. uh, recognizing the need for relief uh, in the context of the pandemic was really fantastic initiative. Uh, and then the you know, creation of the common framework, uh, the, that framework was really very important also. Uh, the problem rather has been kind of in terms of how quickly this framework uh, has been able to deliver and that has taken uh, quite a bit of time. Um, I think there are reforms that are going to be needed to make it much more responsive uh, and agile. And uh, you know, the bank and us have uh, provided some suggestions. So it will be really very important for the G20 um, to, to get the framework to, to deliver the required uh, reprofiling and uh, in some cases restructuring as quickly as possible because you know problems have yeah. intensified rather than ameliorated yeah. over the last several months yeah no i think the key words really is uh, phrases as quick as uh, as possible because time is indeed uh, um, running out but if i can just get a, a quick sense and then we'll turn to the q a portion of uh, this event from uh, from from you I, I get that we're not broadly here at least on this panel calling for a global recession and Julia skates it's 50 50. So, what is the single important risk that you uh, would be most concerned about that could push us in a global uh, recession? I know there's multiple of them, but I, on your list, which one tops your list? I think uh, you know, I can uh, start with uh, yes, go ahead. I mean, you can start. Go ahead, please. I think two, two risks, really. I mean, uh, cool, if I may, uh, first is uh, continued intensification of uh, the food security challenge that we have seen in sub-Saharan Africa in particular. I think that worries me endlessly. Why? Because, you know, what we're seeing is, you know, countries with much more limited fiscal space. And to compound this, I mean, we are seeing in certain countries a decline in humanitarian support from the international community. I was cha in Chad uh, a few weeks ago, and it really was heartbreaking to hear uh, UN officials saying that even the support that they used to get for uh, child malnutrition has declined uh, this year. So really, really, uh, I think the international community is playing with fire. Huh? Mm -hmm. I think we really need to step up and support countries with, with um, food security challenges in particular. Second point I want to stress in terms of the global outlook uh, is one that was touched on, I think, by Steve and Julia also. You know, I, I'm continuing to be reminded about, you know, what a point of maximum uh, uncertainty we are in terms of mm -hmm. uh, how we think about, um, you know, the global economic outlook, how to calibrate policies. And I think thinking deeply uh, about, uh, you know, in terms of how we advise our policymakers is going to be a big challenge for macroeconomic economists at the moment and uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, working through all of the uncertainty of the moment and being cautious in our policy advice I think is warranted mm -hmm. yeah, thank you yes uh, Ayan your single most important risk you're worried about that could will it tilt us over into the recession uh, thank you cool uh, I think that um, when we think about the scenarios I mentioned and uh, we have been working on different scenarios uh, the single really most important risk is a uh, miscalculation of this highly synchronized uh, fiscal and monetary policy withdrawal. And we see that everywhere around the world, Abebe mentioned the case of Africa, uh, limited fiscal space, there is a withdrawal of fiscal uh, support, uh, inflation high, uh, there is withdrawal of monetary policy support. You see that in advanced economies, you see that emerging market developing economies. So this stagflation is type of problem. Uh, you know, the cure is uh, in a sense, unfortunately, at least in the short term, worse than the disease. So you basically try to control the inflationary pressures and, uh, uh, you know, establish price stability. And you try to do that everywhere. And of course, the, when you do it everywhere, the policy multipliers are much larger and we might end up in a point uh, because of how we are aggressive to solve this problem, uh, we put the global economy in recession territory. 
Um, so that is something uh, you know we need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Ayan. Julia. So I, in terms of the top risk, I think it's really something that is outside of policymakers' hands, and that is the functioning of the global goods economy and how uh, how quickly that improves. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that the, has you mean the supply chains uh... exactly. So supply mm -hmm. chains, mm -hmm. uh, availability, uh, and ease with which uh, companies can get access the needed mm -hmm. commodities transport them to where they're demanded mm -hmm. that has been so incredibly disrupted mm -hmm. and added to mm -hmm. you know what has been inherently a disrupted uh, macro economy mm -hmm. um you know it, we can see the private sector hard at work trying to solve these problems mm -hmm. uh, they the incentives are highly aligned to move goods and sell them Mm -hmm. um, but I do worry that the recessionary signal or the recessionary chatter, and this sort of, I think, speaks to Ihan's point a little bit, uh, the fact that everybody is tightening at the same time and sort of the signal from the Fed is we're not afraid to cause a recession if we need to, to cool off inflation. Mm -hmm. That's good from a sort of credibility inflation expectation standpoint, but that sort of disincentivizes investing into supply side capacity of the economy. So I worry a little bit about that, but I think that ultimately, if we do see material improvements over the next six to 12 months, that mm -hmm. could give the Fed space to mm -hmm. tighten less. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the IMF has pointed out since the beginning of this recovery that the fact that the US had put in the most policy support and had the fastest recovery poses an inherent challenge because the mm -hmm. Fed has to tighten policy. Right while the other recoveries are lagging behind. And we are just seeing that dichotomy and that tension mm -hmm. amplified uh, ever more uh, in, in the last, you know, and, and I think the war in Ukraine just amplified that even more. So, you know, we, we can hope for these efficiencies to be restored, some of this uh, functionality to be restored, which would ease a lot of pressures. And there are signs of hope on the commodity side. I mean, we have seen some easing in commodity prices Mm -hmm. um we are seeing more you know open free mm -hmm. flow of of uh goods and people so you know there is a that that's the shot that we have at you know allowing the fed to back off maybe later this year into next year mm -hmm. uh and allow the economy the rest of the world mm -hmm. more breathing room mm -hmm. no that's a, that's that's really great point and getting the global value chain to function properly and importantly give the fed some <laughs> breathing room so uh, the the pace of tightening doesn't have to be as mm -hmm. uh, uh, as as fast and the uh, the rates don't have to go those high this going to certainly uh, help a lot of the uh, em emerging market developing countries that have uh, variable exactly. interest on their debt uh, uh steve well, what uh, what worries you most well um actually what worries me most is a new uh, variant of the pandemic uh that uh, vaccinations don't help uh but that's kind of more in the realm of an asteroid hitting the earth uh, than something kind of like in our macro financial realm. Uh, so sticking to our territory, I guess my, an my answer, what worries me most would be some combination of what Ihan and Julia have said. Basically a situation where either because of persistent supply chain disruptions or because wages and inflation expectations move up more than we might expect, uh, inflation uh, proves uh, much more uh, persistent and even continues to rise than we expect. And central banks have no choice mm -hmm. uh, but to clamp down harder. And that interacts uh, with uh, high debt levels uh, in many countries and stretched valuations in housing markets and other areas of the financial sector uh, to lead to large recessions. Um, mm -hmm. So that's not like when Ihan described it, it kind of it sounded to me a little bit more like central banks and governments making policy mistakes. Uh, this would be a situation where I guess you could argue about whether the tightening would be a policy mistake or not, but it would seem to be uh, required uh, by high levels of inflation. Mm -hmm. So, so that would be a key worry. I, I would note that so obviously a felicitous outcome that Julia outlined 
is for inflation to decline so the Fed doesn't have to tighten so much. I would also note that a certain amount of tightening by the Fed and other central banks mm -hmm. that leads to a mild recession uh, in the United States and other economies wouldn't be the worst thing to, to befall us. Uh, you know, uh, if, you know, if unemployment in the States went from three and a half to four and a half or five, and that succeeded in getting inflation down on a persistent basis, that might be a trade-off worth accepting. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Uh, thank you, Steve. So uh, we now move into the question and answer uh, portion, and I'm gonna try to take them maybe three at a time. Uh, the first one comes from uh, Bozina Bobkova, who's, he's asking, what is your opinion on the monetary policy response of the ECB? And if there's a danger of a new sovereign debt crisis in Europe in case of significant uh, uh, tightening? And I think I would note that now even the Euro and the dollar is getting close to parity. So it seems like uh, we're drawing a bigger wedge between the Fed policy and the ECB. And that might be the context for this question. Um, and uh, the second question comes from uh, Saqib Farouk, who said, can we think of an estimated time frame of improvement in the world economy in the wake of the Russia invasion of Ukraine? and COVID, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic shock. In, in, in other words, is that, are those really the two key things we need to be watching for, for any meaningful recovery? And uh, uh, given the uncertainty as to when and, uh, when and how the Russia was gonna end, what does that mean really for the global economic, uh, economic outlook? Um, and the third question is, do growing fears of recession make the job of central banks easier in terms of pulling uh, demand. So Steve, do you want to take the ECB uh, question? And uh, Julia, if you uh, don't mind taking the question on uh, growing fears of recession, making central banks job easier. And, uh, and, and Ian, uh, the question about the, the timing of uh, improvement in the global economy, given uncertainty around the pandemic and also the Russia invasion of Ukraine. Uh, cool, shall I start with the ECB question? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, so, so first of all, I think that's a tough call uh, and there are pros and cons uh, to its stance. Uh, I guess, um, obviously it's been, you know, its policy has been very accommodative relative to the Fed in the sense of just now starting uh, to tighten. And even, and, and, even, and even the tightening that people envisage is, um, you know, is very slight compared to what people, what the Fed has already done, what the uh, Bank of England has already done, uh, but more than what the Bank of Japan is doing. So I would say that on the, on the minus side, to its, uh, to its current laggard response is the fact that it hasn't helped uh, to basically focus inflation expectations in a way that would contain them. That's the first concern. And the second is, is that by, um, by basically being so slow uh, to plan to tighten, it's allowed the euro to fall a great deal. Now, in now ordinarily, that would not be worrisome given that the euro area economy has not fully recovered from the pandemic and has a, a ways to go to basically get back to its trend output, some stimulus from uh, a lower euro would ordinarily be helpful. The problem in the current situation is that Europe faces this tremendous energy price shock, uh, which is contractionary. And in that context, an even weaker euro means even higher domestic prices uh, of energy. So, so those are the reasons why the ECB probably should have uh, tightened a little quicker or at least vocalized its intention to tighten a little bit quicker. But on the other hand, you know, there are two really key issues. Uh, number one is, as I mentioned, the Euro area economy has not recovered as quickly as that in the United States. And the second and more pressing concern is that monetary tightening by the ECB 
leads to the prospect of out of control yields and spreads for Italy. Mm -hmm. And that could be truly damaging uh, to financial stability. So weighing these two, these different pros and cons against each other, I guess I'd have to say uh, that it's hard to love ECB policy, uh, but I'm hard put to come up with a better one. Mm -hmm. Yes, Julia, please. So in terms of the question of can talking about a recession help us avoid one, I think the answer is potentially yes. And we saw, for example, when the Fed pivoted yet again to a more aggressive uh, rate hike in June, it coincided roughly with the peak in oil prices, with the peak in inflation compensation in financial markets. So it is possible, but I mean, there's a certain amount of follow through that they need to put their money where their mouth is and show their willingness to follow through and their commitment to cooling off inflation. But if there is an element of, you could call it inflation expectations built into commodity prices uh, and other asset prices, and that comes out uh, and therefore provide some relief on a, a range of, of prices uh, and maybe alters behavior somewhat, then yeah, maybe, maybe that is part of the cure uh, and, and allows the Fed again sometime maybe later this year or early next year to pivot away from ever tighter policy and provide support to uh, cushion the blow of all of this tightening. So I, I think it's not an unreasonable hypothesis and we can certainly hope for that. Okay, very good. Uh, Ayan, over to you. Uh, thank you, Kul. Uh, in the context of you know when we will see the uh, light at the end of the tunnel, uh, the first observation is that um, uh, according to our projections, uh, global growth will remain more or less around 3% uh till 2024 so we, we are not expecting a kind of a rebound from this year uh over the next two years given the kind of the policy stances and we think that inflation will remain persistent uh even though it will come down from these high levels uh we have been seeing but at the end of 24 we still 23 we still see global inflation around three percent uh, which recorded around you know two percent prior to the pandemic, and that uh, poses significant challenges to central bankers. So that the big question is that yes, you can reduce inflation, but can you reduce inflation to the target you, you are trying to hit? In the context of the war, let me make the following point. Of course, the war uh, can uh, evolve in unpredictable ways. Uh, it can spread over a larger area. Uh, or can take the form of you know, widespread uh, state-sponsored cyber attacks, which we were really worried at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and these cyber attacks can paralyze public infrastructure, financial system, uh, systems that can translate into, of course, uh, additional sanctions and retaliation. So uh, if that happens, we will end up seeing even uh, you know, worse uh, growth outcomes. Um, the third point is that you know, when we think about this near term, we always need to understand the consequence of pandemic as well as the war for the medium term prospects. And I think Abebe uh, very uh, elegantly alluded to that. Uh, now, uh, we already had a, a slowdown in potential growth prior to the pandemic. You know, uh, we thought that uh, during 2010s, uh, potential growth average around 5% in emerging market developing economies. And beyond 2020s, we thought that it will average around 4%. This was you know, our estimates prior to the pandemic. After the pandemic, because of the hit on investment, uh, uh, human capital, uh, we are thinking that uh, emerging market developed economies will struggle on average to deliver uh, around Two and a half percent growth uh, when we think about their ability to generate growth. And in this context, let me uh, make one more observation. Uh, we are, of course, really worried, and I think IMF colleagues also look at these issues. There is a divergence uh, in uh, 
uh, per capita uh, growth rates in a way that um, that is really disturbing. So when you look at you know what happened, uh, the the per, per capita income growth in 2010s, the difference between emerging developed economies and advanced economies, that number was around um, 2.3 percent. Now. Uh, in the near future, that number is going to go down uh, by 75%. You will have the difference around 0.6%. For low-income countries, there is basically divergence. The growth rate at the per capita level is you know, lower than the growth rate per capita level of advanced economies. So these economies are getting poorer relative to uh, you know, the kind of the high-income countries we want them to get to the level of. So there is a serious challenge and how that challenge will translate into other types of problems, the, especially the, you know, the social tensions uh, has to be seen. That's why a global community needs to be very active and take this the food crisis issue uh, very seriously. Uh, let me stop there, Paul. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, no, thank you, Ayan. So we may have room for mm -hmm. one more question. And uh, uh, this one uh, goes to Abebe. Yeah, in Nigeria, where I come from, we are besieged with uh, multi-pronged crisis from uh, insecurity, conflict, violence, extremism, and weak economy uh, due to over-reliance on oil as the only source of revenue. What will be your antidote to these problems, not only in Nigeria, but in Africa? I think the point that's being highlighted here is that there are many priorities when you look at what needs to be done. So how do you uh, advise when I was picking priorities among the priorities? Thanks, Cole. Um So, you know, uh, in, a, in a way, kind of Nigeria and six, seven other countries in uh, sub-Saharan Africa in particular uh, ought to be benefiting uh, from this moment where commodity prices are quite high, oil prices included. Um, and so, you know, uh, but for, you know, the domestic policy structure, this would have been a very good moment for overall for the Nigerian economy. But, you know, this goes back, I had talked a lot about the, the divergence that we're seeing uh, amongst countries. But I think Nigeria is a good way to also show kind of the divergence within countries, the huge distributional consequences that the you know, conjuncture, the commodity price movements are said to have. So, you know, in Nigeria, because um, they export oil, they get quite a bit of oil, but also because they subsidize, um, they subsidize uh, domestic consumption quite a bit. There's, you know, what's going to end up happening is that uh, the benefits will be diffuse and not be helping the overall economy as much as uh, as uh, should happen at the moment um, and so Nigeria you know the central bank is a very is in a very invidious position like other central banks where if they tighten uh, they risk uh, slowing economic activity and if they remain loose they they risk uh, the anchoring inflation expectations which are already accelerating but I think this is a moment when uh, as elsewhere in uh, in many other countries uh, some bold decisions that are going to have to be taken. Um, you know, I think two things in particular. First and foremost, uh, wherever there are fuel type subsidies, these tend to be very regressive and tackling them head on uh, is going to be important. Uh, you know, removing those distortions over time while targeting support for the most vulnerable households is imperative. And then second, uh, again, you know, diversifying away from over-reliance on oil uh, is going to be important. Um, in other countries, it's of course other commodities. Uh, so, you know, advancing that reform agenda really imperative also. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, very good. So um, this is uh, getting really close to the uh, end of, uh, end of uh, our time. So clearly uh, a, a really series of, uh, um, of shocks and uh, a lot of risk, many of them really tilted uh, to the downside. But, uh, you know, hopefully in the midst of all of this that looks uh, gloom and doom, there could be uh, a way forward. And uh, thank you all for having really shared your perspective as well as your recommendations on uh, how we can continue to, uh, to push forward and, uh, and uh, avoid hopefully a global, global recession. Uh, so thank you again. And uh, I hope we can welcome you again in the near future to continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Cole. Yes, been a pleasure.